love this guitar sound. Ready? Majesty, worship his majesty. Unto Jesus be our glory, honor, and praise. Majesty, kingdom authority, flow from his throne unto his own, his anthem raise. So exalt, lift up on high. I do one more and this is a new one it's called rescue me the one I wrote
Thank you. Okay, that's a new one. So I need, I usually do a new collection of songs. I usually do 14 songs, and I've done, I got eight done, so I need six more to do. So keep that in prayer if I can knock these off. That's, that's the newest one. And um, good morning to everyone, first of all. Hope everybody had a, a nice Thanksgiving. And um, I just like to, want you all to know that we dodged the big storm weather-wise. We should have been buried by now with snow starting at 3 o'clock in the morning. But I was listening to the KCIG weatherman. He was like, we're either going to get a, a hit with a, a 4 to 8 inches or we're going to get nothing. We're right on the line. And I'm looking at this, this, the line. It's like we're just the, above the, the storm. So thank you. And if Lori Coppersmith down in Alabama has been praying for us, she's been telling me the storm was coming and going to hit us. I was like, hope you're praying. And so her prayers have been answered by God. So if we get anything, I bet you it's just going to be a little bit, not like what they were talking about. They were talking about blizzard, you know, windy, you know, whiteout, you know, blizzards conditions. Like, are you kidding me? But I don't see anything out there. I don't know about you guys, so. Which is a good thing. So, if you could, turn your Bibles to 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. Just a couple announcements uh, we're, uh, before we uh, get underway. Uh, for the, a lot of these announcements are for the, our internet people or people who are unfamiliar with our ministry. Our, our class schedule is Tuesday, uh, Wednesday, Tuesday and Thursday evenings from 7 to 8 p.m. We have a prayer meeting after class on Thursdays where our internet people can join us through the website, and also Sunday mornings, of course, where we go from 9 to about 10, 15, and we observe the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of each month, usually, unless something comes up, but it's usually in the first Sunday of each month, and then service usually runs to about t- 9 to 10, 15, uh, 10, 30, 10, 30, excuse me. So usually it's on 10, 15, it ends on Sunday. And uh, we have a prayer meeting after class on Sundays, uh, and also our, uh, we record and video all of our classes. Thank you for Titus. Uh, he runs and dev- he has designed our website, and he runs the website maintains it so uh, we record video audio all of our classes um, and so we've never had to delete any of our our video or audio uh, a lot of places they can't keep everything but Titus has got a, a good deal with a, a site um, st- to store all these things so we can ha- not have to delete any of these lessons so which I love we have over a thousand written documents on our website uh, we uh, we, th- we uh, all of our we have the exegesis and exposition exegesis our interpretation of the different books of the Bible that we've done in the past uh, we're an expository type ministry. That means we go through the different books of the Bible, verse by verse, paragraph by paragraph, book by book, and we alternate from Old Testament to New Testament. So uh, right now we're doing First Thessalonians on Sundays, and our weekday classes we're doing First John, but we're about to finish it off this Tuesday, and uh, then we're going to be doing a, the next next book on our weekday classes is an Old Testament book called the Book of Haggai. And it's only two chapters long, and I'm looking forward to doing that. But in between books, we do this as well. We do different various subjects, doctrines, uh, important doctrines in the Bible. We've done the Trinity. We've done sanctification, justification, the rapture. And, uh, and in between the, the First John and, uh, and Haggai, we're going to be doing the Remnant of Israel series, which is going to take us for a couple of months. It's going to take us through Christmas into, the, into February. So it's a, a big study that will help us in our study of the ha- book of Haggai and uh, also help us in our study of the Old Testament in the future as well, and New Testament. So uh, uh, we, uh, that's our, uh, who we are. We are. Our website is www.wenstrom.org. We have, uh, st- we, uh, have a lot of our stuff, uh, the video cl- of our classes are on YouTube. We have a YouTube page, Facebook page, Google+, and uh, some of my, uh, a lot of my written documents are in a place called Academia Edu. If you're interested, you can go get our stuff there too as well. And uh, also, where we don't put a address, you might notice uh, you don't, we don't put an, uh, a mailing addre- address on our. Um, we have a PO box, a mailing address there on the website, but we don't have a, a an address where we meet posted on the website because we meet in a home. We meet in Titus and Jody Thompson's home here in Marion, Iowa. So. For obvious reasons, we don't put the uh, their address there on the website. So if you do want to come and visit us and join us, and people have, uh, you just uh, email us through the website or call us. My personal number is actually on the website. So if you call that number, you'll get me, and I'll give you directions to uh, the Thompson home. So um, let's uh, take a moment of silent prayer. This is our custom. We take a moment of silent prayer to examine ourselves to see if we're in fellowship with God. We need to confess our sins. Confession of sin restores us to fellowship with God according to 1 John 1, 9. And we maintain that fellowship by obeying the Holy Spirit who speaks to us through the scriptures which he's inspired. That's when we're obeying the command of Ephesians 5, 18 to be filled with the Spirit. So if there's anything that's bothering you, disturbing or distracting to you, do what 1 Peter 5, 7 says. Cast all your anxieties upon the Lord because he cares for you. So with our heads bowed and our eyes closed, let us pray.
Heavenly Father, we thank you for this day that you've given to us. We thank you for the, the storm missing us. Not the brunt, we're not facing the brunt of it, and it looks like we might not get anything. So we thank you for that, and uh, we just thank you for another day to uh, experience and enjoy creation, to be on this earth, and to fellowship, more importantly, with you, your Son, and the Holy Spirit, and other like-minded believers. We thank you for everyone that is in the Thompson home here this morning, and those who are joining us, part of our internet family uh, in various parts of this country and the world. We thank you for Tyson Jody's hospitality and opening up their home to us three days a week and the sacrifices they and their family make so that uh, this could take place. We thank you, Father, uh, for the Thanksgiving holidays, bringing us home safely uh, through this these holidays. And, and we also pray that you would help us to uh, put our uh, things in perspective when we face approaching the Christmas holidays and not get uh, down about it and uh, with the, uh, and realize it's uh, been commercialized commercialized because of the de- we're in the devil's world. So help us uh, always recall the true meaning of the season as we approach the, the Christmas and help us to keep our priorities and not get distracted by this world system that opposes uh, your son Jesus Christ and the church and the word of God. We just thank you for electing us and predestinating us to be conformed to the image of your son. We thank you for the person and work of his son, Jesus Christ, that the cross is resurrection and session at your right hand. And we thank you for the work of the Holy Spirit in our lives from regeneration to resurrection and all the things that he does for us and uh, has done for us and will do for us in the future. We thank you for the fact that we're going to get a resurrection body at any moment. And if we were to die, we'd be absent from the body face to face with your son, Jesus Christ. No more seared, uh, no more tears, no more sorrow, and no more sin. And we just uh, thank you for the fact that we can get rewards if we're faithful. So help us to, uh, to, be per- to persevere and to love you with all our entire being and our neighbor as ourself and our fellow believers, your son, Jesus Christ, has taught us to do. We pray that the Spirit would work mightily and powerfully through each person in the audience here and also as myself as the communicator. We pray that you would help each person by the power of the Spirit to learn, understand, and apply what they're being taught. Help them to be sensitive to the Spirit's guidance and direction and to concentrate. We thank you for each of them and we pray, Father, that they would receive the necessary spiritual nourishment. We pray that you would help me to empower me to accurately interpret and communicate the contents of First, John, First Thessalonians 2.2 2 here this morning. And I pray, Father, that you would work mightily and powerfully through both me and the audience. And we just pray, Father, that as a result of this service, all of us can continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ. So it is in his name we pray, the King of kings and the Lord of lords. Amen. All right, you should be at First John, uh, First, I keep saying First John, First Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. And uh, you should have my translation uh, open to that verse as well. We're going to be noting First Thessalonians 2, 2 here this morning, uh, where Paul uh, asserts that he and his companions suffered for proclaiming the gospel in Philippi and Thessalonica. So as we pointed out last week, when we get uh, we look at the the introduction of First Thessalonians, which is is in the first chapter, we see in verse First Thessalonians one five that uh, we see that it, there's a mention of Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy uh, suffering and uh, and also uh, defending their character, uh, defending their character, and the reason why they had to do that is because they had to leave Thessalonica abruptly, as we saw in Acts seventeen. And uh, so that, uh, because they were away, the people, the Christian community in Thessalonica was receiving slanderous accusations against Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, uh, accusing them, obviously, of trying to leave, uh, le- abandon them and leave town, and that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were just a bunch of charlatans like these Greek philosophers of the day who were just out for money and, and exploiting people for money. So uh, Paul, and Silvanus, and Timothy write for his Thessalonians. One of the reasons they write, write this letter is to defend their character, and they felt the need to do so because they, it was obviously a possibility that the Thessalonians Christian community might start listening to these slanderous reports and stop listening to their teaching and that's what he did not want to have happen so as I pointed out there are times where a pastor many times will have to defend his character not simply because he for himself but for the sake of others because if others listen to slanderous accusations about him uh, then p- people in his church might listen to that and d- drift away and, and, and abandon the teaching of the word of God which is more important than anything so uh, chapter 2 is basically developing what is mentioned briefly in 1 Thessalonians 1 5 and it's all about Paul, Silvanus and Timothy defending their character against these accusations which came from the non-believers in Thessalonica not just uh, uh, the Jews but also the Gentile non-believers were persecuting people in the church and particularly the Gentile uh, non-believers 
in Thessalonica were the re- actually the ones that were giving the Thessalonians the hardest time because the Thessalonians, as we pointed out, were primarily Gentile. In fact, we know that he's writing it primarily Gentile because if you, you see that uh, he's, what he says in 1 Thessalonians 1, 9, and 10, uh, he says that uh, the Thessalon- Thessalonians turned to God from idols. Well, the Jewish Christian community... Uh, the Jews, for, uh, for instance, in that day, after the Babylonian dis- uh, uh, deportation, never got involved in, in idolatry. But the Greek, uh, the Gentiles were immersed in Greek idol- uh, uh, idolatry, uh, worshipping a multitude, a plethora of gods, the Greco pantheon of Gre- Greco-Roman gods. So we see that the Gentile, the non-Christian community of Gentiles uh, were actually persecuting the Thessalonians. And we also, we pointed out, this was nothing like what the violence that was uh, 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 committed against Paul and Silvanus, as we'll see this morning in Philippi. Uh, it was actually uh, ostracism, social ostracism. If you were a Gentile, became a believer in Jesus Christ, uh, much like today, you were, uh, you, when you didn't worship the gods of the city, uh, you could be c- accused of actually bringing the city into danger with the gods and being disciplined by the gods uh, because you forsook worshiping them. And so there was that to deal with, that, there was that pressure of families. You were leaving behind your family and friend, not worshiping them with them in the, where they were worshiping. Much like I told you with my family, I was raised a Roman Catholic, and when I left the, the, uh, the Catholic Church at 18, it caused the big stick, and it was a lot of pressure. And for a 19, 18-year-old guy, it was not something that was very comfortable. It was a form of persecution and pr- also, uh, pressure. So I, I, uh, by, the, by the grace of God, I stayed away from it. But there was stuff like that that I think everybody here in the room has maybe experienced at some point. Uh, you might, uh, like for instance, uh, Tyler and Cheyenne, they go to, they've gone, with, when they were at school, I mean, they were Christians, and now most of their friends are not Christians, and I'm sure they faced their, uh, uh, you know, ridicule from people who thought, oh, you went to church, oh, you went to, how many times a week you go to church? And they probably got laughed at for that or mocked or ridiculed for that, and we all do. I, I mean, I was ridiculed and mocked for that too. So that's all a form of persecution it doesn't have to be violence involved but it can be social ostracism as well people don't want to hang out with you anymore because you're a christian and they don't they don't like being around you anymore because you make them feel uncomfortable because you're not committing the same sins that they like to commit and so this is all what we're talking about here in Thess- uh, first thessalonians so if you could let's read the for, uh, si- uh, first 16 verses of first thessalonians look at first thessalonians chapter 2 and then we'll look at verse 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 1. We'll look at uh, verse 2 in detail in a few moments. So we'll read verses 1 through 16 of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2. I'm reading from the Net Bible, for those who are interested. For you yourselves know, brothers and sisters, about our coming to you. It is not proven to be purposeless. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. For the appeal we make does not come from error or impurity or with deceit. But just as we have been approved by God to be entrusted with the gospel, so we declare it not to please people but God who examines our hearts. For we never appeared with flattering speech, as you know, nor with a pretext for greed. God is our witness. Now flattering speech, pretext for greed, that's the Greek philosophers of their day would do that. Who taught different, uh, at, different teachers that came through cities and they would basically will flatter people, and they would be look, trying to exploit them for money. So then it goes on to say, nor did we seek glory from people, either from you or from others, verse 7, although we could have imposed our weight as apostles of Christ. They could have uh, required fi- uh, financial support from them because of uh, the principle, Galatians 6, 6, those who are taught the word of God or share all good things with those who teach them. But Paul and uh, Silvanus decided not to do that. And we'll talk about that when we get this further into this chapter. Instead, we became little children among you, like a nursing mother caring for her own children. With such affection for you, we were happy to share with you not only the gospel of God, but also our own lives, because you became dear to us. For you recall, brothers and sisters, our toil and drudgery, 
and by working night and day so as not to impose a burden on any of you we preach to you the gospel of God so uh, stop there for a second there and we'll talk about this later in detail Paul, Silvanus and Timothy uh, did not uh, take up an offering for themselves with the Thessalonians though they, they had the right to do that uh, Jesus taught in Luke 10 and, and Matthew 10 that uh, his disciples that a worker is worthy of his wages Paul quotes that in 1 Thessalonians 5 with regards to the support of the pastor but these guys didn't do that they were church planners uh, they're different than what I do uh, I'm in a certain area and I, I church plant but I stay in that area I don't move around and I'm not itinerant Paul, Sylvanus and Timothy they did that. They bumped from place to place because they church planted. They, and so uh, in order to, uh, that no, uh, money would never be an issue that would cause people uh, to not give a hearing, they would not require of, of people money just so that no, we could, nobody could accuse them of, uh, of being uh, out for money. So once they started the church, they established pastors. And then you'll see Paul in 1 Timothy and uh, Titus he would tell Timothy, you know, a, pa- a worker's worthy of his wages. A pa- and 1 Corinthians 9, he says this, that you know, in Galatians 6, 6, those who are taught the good word of God should, uh, should say all good things with those who teach him. So, uh, but to, ch- to plant the church, Paul would not take a salary. That's why he, if you look at Philippians, he actually took money from them, financial support, but usually he didn't take it from anybody. He'd support himself. Just so uh, money would never be an issue in these church plants. So uh, he goes on to say, And uh, in in verse 10 again, he says, you are witnesses and so is God as to how holy, righteous and blameless our conduct was toward you who believe. As you know, we treated each one of you as a father treats his own children, exhorting and encouraging you and insisting that you live in a way worthy of God who calls you to his own kingdom and his glory. And so we too constantly thank God that when you received God's message that you heard from us, You accepted it not as a human message, but as it truly is, God's message, which is at work among you who believe. Notice God's word works in us when we trust it when it says. For you became imitators, brothers and sisters, of God's churches in Christ Jesus that are in Judea, because you too suffer the same things from your own countrymen, those were non, uh, non-believing Gentiles in Thessalonica, as they in fact did from the Jews. So the Jewish Christian community suffered from their non-Jewish uh, countrymen in Judea. And so the Thessalonians understood, they could identify with that because their own non-believing Gentile countrymen persecuted them as well. So there's a, as we'll see when we get to this part of the chapter, he's trying, to, if there's a solidarity there, there's an encouragement there for the Thessalonians. You're not alone. You're not the only group of Christians that are suffering in the world today for being identified with Jesus and obeying his teaching. So he goes on to say in verse 15, continuing to describe the Jews at the end of verse 14, those non-believing Jews, who they killed both the Lord Jesus and the prophets and persecuted us severely. They're displeasing to God and are opposed to all people because they hinder us from speaking to the Gentiles so that they may be saved. Thus they constantly fill up their measure of sins, but wrath has come upon them completely. So we're going to be looking at First Thessalonians chapter 2 here this morning. Uh, look at First Thessalonians 2, 1 in my translation. I just want to read the first two verses of my translation. For you yourselves, in contrast to those who oppose us, possess the conviction, brothers and sisters, that our reception, which was among all of you, is absolutely not characterized as being without results. But in fact, although we previously suffered, yes, we were verbally and physically abused in Philippi, as each one of you are well aware of, for our own, for our own benefit, we courageously communicated the one and only gospel originating from the one and only God and the presence of each of you by means of God's power, that's the spirit, as we'll see this morning, and the face of great opposition. So we, we saw, we left off last Sunday in 1 Thessalonians 2, 1, and we noted in our study of that verse that this verse states that the Thessalonian Christian community possessed the conviction that their reception of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy was by no means characterized as being without results. Now, it's, when he says this, it's not, uh, when he says it was not without results or purposeless, as the Net Bible says, he's not saying that the work of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy was in vain or without results, but rather that the Thessalonians' positive response to the gospel in faith uh, which and the gospel was communicated to them by these three men was not in vain or without results. It was not in vain 
because or without results or purposeless because the message they believed people and we left off with this last week was from God and that was evidenced by the godly conduct of Paul, Silvanus and Timothy and their transformed lives. So the Thessalonians could be be aware of the fact and could have the uh, be assurance uh, have assurance that the message that they uh, the, the Paul, Silvanus and Timothy's message to them was not without results first of all because the character of Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy demonstrated that they were speaking from God. Uh, they, if they had ungodly conduct, you could not confirm that. But you could confirm it by the way they practiced what they taught. They taught what they practiced what they taught. And then second of all, the Thessalonians could look at their transformed lives and see, okay, we believed this message from these three guys, so it was not in vain or purposeless. We weren't, in other words, we weren't deceived. Uh, like many of the philosophers of that day would do with people. Now, the godly behavior of these three men, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, which is the subject of 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, 1-16, through 16, demonstrated that the Thessalonians' positive response to the gospel was not in vain or without results because it demonstrated that the message they received by faith was indeed from God and not from the devil. So you can, here's the application. You can confirm for yourself if what you're getting here. Uh, is on your for, if you go to another church if what you're getting is from God or not and uh, a couple of things one look at the the man who's communicating the word of God to you look at his behavior and second of all look at how the word of God has changed your life as I said before it's good to do an inventory from time to time where were you ten years ago when we first uh, where were you eight years ago when we started this uh, ministry in Marion if some of you have been with me way back to prayer of you and how is your how is your uh, attitude to it, the word of god changed or how has the word of god changed your life how has it shaped your priorities uh, your behavior the things that you used you you might not do anymore that you used to do and now because the teaching the holy spirit through the teaching has transformed your your priorities your attitude and your conduct and so that's an, uh, an evidence of the fact that God is working in this ministry. So therefore, 1 Thessalonians 2.2 2 presents an emphatic addition and contrast with the assertions in 1 Thessalonians 2.1. So there's a contrast between these two verses, but it's emphatic. It's, it's very emphatic here, it's, uh, the way the original is. So we saw that verse 2, we have in verse 2 asserts that although Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy suffered undeservedly, and specifically, as we'll see, they were verbally and physically abused in Philippi prior to arriving in Thessalonica. They also courageously, despite that, communicated the gospel to the Thessalonians in the face of great pers- uh, opposition. So they had a lot of perseverance, these three. And if you're going to be a communicator of the word of God, and just if you're not, maybe you're just a, a lay person, you're, you don't have the gift to pass the teacher, you need perseverance to grow up spiritually because there's a lot of opposition to that and a lot of opposition to Jesus Christ and the teaching of the word of God because we do live in the devil's world and the devil would like to shut this place down as he would all places that are teaching the word of God for the simple reason is that the word of God is alive and powerful and it breaks down barriers that sin is Satan to put up. So you can, uh, you're a threat. This is a threat, this ministry. And it doesn't matter how big or small the ministry is. Big things happen out of little th- uh, beginnings. Always remember that. And so the, remember Jesus and the apostles. It was a small band of uh, p- apostles and disciples of Jesus. Not even 200 in number, which turned the world upside down. And so uh, always keep that in mind. And also again, when we're weak, we're strong. Uh, you know, and remember God uh, was showing Gideon when he went out to fight uh, the, that the Arabs that had overrun the area of Judea. Uh, he uh, got together different people from uh, of the Jews and called them to war. And God sifted through those people. So, so there was only 300 night rangers who attacked the enemy. And he, God didn't need 20,000, 30,000 soldiers to defeat over 100,000 Arabs that were in the land. He used 300 night rangers, as the book of Gideon says, to defeat them. And so uh, God can do great things through a small group of people. So verse 2 is expressing in emphatic terms that in addition to the Thessalonians' positive response to the gospel message communicated to them by Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, uh, not being without results, these three men, also communicated the gospel to the Thessalonians courageously in the midst of great opposition, even though they had already suffered, and specifically, 
were verbally and physically abused doing the same thing in Philippi. So therefore, the emphatic contrast is this. It's between the positive results of the Thessalonians receiving by faith the gospel message and the undeserved suffering, and specifying, specifically the verbal and physical abuse these three men, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, experienced while communicating the gospel in Philippi and Thessalonica. So you have, you have the positive results among the Philippians that the gospel message had, but now you're seeing a contrast with this. In verse 2, where Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy is saying, we suffered not only in Thessalonica, but we suffered in Philippi prior to Thessalonica. So we persevered. And so this is very important. It, what he's basically saying is that uh, you can't, we're, we're legitimate. You, you know, nobody, listen to uh, Thomas Constable. He has a great quote, and he says it even better than I could. He says, listen to me, listen to what he says. He says, Paul and his companions were not on a vacation trip. They had come to Thessalonica after having suffered, been insulted, beaten, and imprisoned for preaching the gospel in Philippi. This mission had cost them dearly, but God gave them uncommon boldness to stand up at the synagogue at Thessalonica and preach the exact same message that had brought them persecution in Philippi. And when opposition broke out in Thessalonica, the missionaries kept on preaching. This is not the reaction of people who were trying to make money or build personal reputations at the expense of their hearers. Don't miss that. Let me interject something. You can tell if your pastor or somebody, whoever your pastor is, is legit. If he's been through a, a, a persecution or been uh, vilification or whatnot, and he's had some opposition to him, uh, you know, like Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, they, 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 you can't, they, they kept going, and people who are out to build their personal reputations or make money wouldn't continue. After Thessalonica, after Philippi, they would have stopped. They would have stopped. But they didn't. They kept going. And wh who would do that? Why would you keep doing, even though it's not going to help your personal reputation? In fact, you're going to get a bad reputation staying in that area. But they kept staying in that area and kept on teaching the gospel. They weren't out for money because they, nobody was giving them any money. They were getting beat up and thrown into jail. So if they were out for money, uh, why would they stay in the area? You see? So uh, this is very, very important. So uh, it takes some, think, think about what, what's going on here and then make an application. You can make an application and, 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 and make a, an assessment of your pastor if he's out for the money or trying to build his personal reputation. And so uh, a constable goes on to say, Paul called on his readers to remember these actions and to recognize the sincerity behind them. The missionary's boldness amid strong in opposition was the sign of God at work in his servants and was proof of their genuineness. So that's very important, end of quote. Great quote from Thomas Constable. So one of the things that's important for a pastor or an evangelist is sincerity. You, you must not be... You must not be out for money or your personal reputation. Listen to me. There's a lot of men in the ministry, unfortunately, especially, in, and they're all over the place, but in America, you can see this, that are just, they're just, and they're evangelical people, and they, a lot of people are very impressed by these people. They might be very charismatic and very eloquent, teaching sound doctrine, but they're out about their personal reputations. Uh, they're about their personal reputations. They don't dare rub anybody the wrong way. They play hobby horses or play to the crowd. Uh, they know if their people are conservative and their background. So they'll talk about, you know, uh, social things like gun laws and all that stuff and uh, the, uh, conservative issues just to try to play to those people because they know those people give them money. So they're not going to say anything about anything negative about anything and because they want to keep those people around. And so, or they know that the president, let's say when President Obama's in office, and so they will speak against the president. Now, if they're, they're in a democratic area, and so uh, they'll speak against Trump because he's, he's Republican. So they'll, their people are Democratic. They'll say stuff that, uh, you know, about, uh, badly about uh, President Trump. Why do I say this? Because these men are not about their 
uh, not about the sincerity of the gospel. They're about their uh, money and trying to and their personal reputations. They don't. A lot of these men would not be in the ministry if they lived in a culture that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were in, because they would be they would be uh, slanderously attacked and even verbally and, and physically abused in this country. I think I know some pastors in the Christian community in America who, if they were violence was threatened against them, they would take out their guns. I'm sorry, I don't do that. Oh, do, do I do I uh, do I have uh, do I have gu- I have a shotgun in my house, but I don't even have any ammunition in the thing. Do I? I'm not against people who have guns, but my 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 ministry is not going to be about uh, about guns. I make guns an issue. Where's my faith in God to protect me? Like Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy, and the prophets of Israel and Jesus, did they whip out their guns, their AK-40 to defend themselves? No. I, I, I trust in God, and if it means that I get physically or verbally abused, so be it. Uh, when I'm weak, when I'm, I'm strong. Jesus was persecuted. Violence was committed against him and Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy. Why should I be any different and, and, and persevere through that if it comes to that? And that's the way we should be. Uh, where's your confidence and strength coming from? God or your weapons? That's what I just want to throw that in there because that when I say that, some people don't like me because I say that. But you know what? I'm right. I'm right, and I'll fight anybody to the, on, in the Word of God on that. They know I'm right. They don't dare challenge me on that. Because what comes down to is do you believe what the Word of God says, or you're going to go with the, your social or your conservative program or your liberal agenda says, rather than the Bible. You make your decisions in life and conduct based upon the Word of God. Now, Philippi, he mentions Philippi. Look at your Bibles, please. Look at Philippians 2.1. I guess, actually, 2.2. Excuse me, what did I say? Philippians 2 2. 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, verse 2. Sorry, I'm thinking of ahead to Philippians. 1 Thessalonians 2 2. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. So Philippi, what is that? It's right up the road from Thessalonica. Uh, it refers to an important Roman city and colony in the province of Macedonia, which is now known as Greek, uh, Greece. And it was located about nine miles from the Aegean coast and the local port of Neapolis, and approximately, it was 80 miles northeast of Thessalonica. So Philippi, where Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were in prison and actually were beaten and we'll find out that was unbelievable social, uh, pro, uh, that was terrible what they did to them because they were Roman citizens. Silvanus and Paul were, and the people in that city who did that, the magistrates in that city could be liable to execution themselves for doing that to a Roman citizen, which is quite interesting. So they're right up the road. Philippi, which had a great Christian community there, Paul wrote to them in the book of Philippians is that book, and they were a great group of Christians up there and Philippi, just 80 miles northeast of Thessalonica. Now, a man named uh, Wanamaker, who is a great commentator on Thessalonians, he writes the following, according to Acts 16, 19 through 24, and Acts 16, 35 through 39, Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were publicly humiliated by, uh, by, primarily Paul and Silvanus, excuse me, they were publicly humiliated by being beaten with rods, despite their being that despite the fact that they were Roman citizens and they were thrown into jail by the magistrates in Philippi. Okay? Now you would think, and that's the end of the quote, you would think after they, that happened to them, that when they get to Thessalonica, they would keep quiet. They would not say boo to anybody. They're not going to communicate the gospel just to play it safe because who wants to go through that again? But what do they do? Paul, Silvanus, go into South Thessalonica, 80 miles south of Philippi, and they do the same thing. Now, what does that tell you about these guys? One, courage. And why do they have this courage? Because they knew the message they had was the power of God for salvation. That's why they kept doing it. They saw its work in their own lives, and they saw it in the lives of God's people. So, the one and only gospel. If you look at uh, my translation of 1 Thessalonians 2.2, it says, But in fact, although we previously suffered... Yes, we were verbally and physically abused in Philippi, as each one of you are well aware of. For our benefit, we courageously communicated the one and only gospel, and I'll explain that translation in a minute, originating from the one and only God. 
So notice it's a little bit different than your translations. And the presence of each of you by means of God's power in the face of great opposition. So the one and only gospel and the one and only God, the reason why I translate it that way is because the article in the Greek before these words, uh, euangelion, gospel, and God, theos, when you have the article there in those instances, it's we, what we it's what we call a monadic notion, meaning uh, monadic means it's unique. In other words, when he uses the article before this word gospel, it's saying that this gospel is unique. Now, the, the, as we'll see in a moment, the, the, the Roman emperor had his gospel. But this article is saying this is the only gospel that is worthy of the name. And then God there, Theos, it was a reminder of the Thessalonians that the God that they now worship is the true and living God. In contrast, as we saw last Sunday, uh, in contrast to the false gods that you used to worship prior to becoming believers in Jesus Christ. So the gospel there in 1 First Thess- First Thessalonians 2, 2 in your English Bibles, and the phrase, the one and only gospel in my translation, is expressing an, a, ma- a monadic idea in the original that indicates that this gospel is one of a kind or unique in the sense that this gospel is unique to God. Now, as I said earlier, the Roman emperor at the time, uh, he proclaimed his gospel in the first century AD, but the articular form of this word, euangelion, gospel, is indicating that the gospel proclaimed by Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy in, is the only true gospel, okay? So this word is used with reference to the content of teaching which Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy communicated to the Thessalonians when they were unsaved. It also is, that, that, that gospel to the unsaved in Thessalonica uh, asserts that Jesus Christ died on the cross, rose again on the third day, and that through faith in him, the sinner can receive the gift of eternal life and the forgiveness of sins. That's the gospel to the with regards to the non-believer. But also this word gospel is speaking of the good news, that's what gospel means, to the believing Christian community. And we saw this in Colossians and other places in the New Testament. So the gospel, when it's used in relation to us Christians and the Thessalonian Christian community, it refers to the fact that it, the, uh, the good news, the, uh, it speaks of the good news, the gospel, uh, to the Thessalonians and all Christians after their conversion or justification that they were identified with Christ and his death and resurrection. That's good news because that identification with Jesus and his death and resurrection, uh, when we appropriate it by faith, will give us victory over our sin nature and and, and the devil in his kingdom. So that's good news for us. And as we also saw, the gospel in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, and we saw this in Colossians chapter 1, Sometimes the gospel refers to rewards for believers, for faithful service. That's what we saw the word used in Colossians chapter 1, verses 5 and 23. We studied that in detail. So the gospel is threefold. And with regards to the non-believer, the good news, the gospel, is that you sinners can have eternal life and the forgiveness of sins through faith in Jesus Christ as your Savior. The good news for the believer is twofold. One, You've been identified with Jesus in his death and resurrection. That identification gives you victory over sin and Satan. That's why Paul says in Romans 6 and Colossians 3, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Why? Because you died with Christ and you're raised with Christ. And second of all, the good news in this passage in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2 is the good news that you and I can get rewards for faithful service. And that, as we'll see a little later on in the service, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy proclaimed the gospel in Thessalonica and in Philippi despite being physically and verbally abused because they knew that they would get rewards for doing so. Nothing wrong with that. Rewards, the promise of rewards, guarantee of rewards if we're faithful in this life is is certainly a motivation. It'll keep you going and persevering through trials and tribulations. I know it does me. I can see many times, you know, uh, being down, and and when you're in the ministry, you can get down very easy because we live in a culture that doesn't want to hear the word of God, even in the Christian community. So to keep you going, you say, well, I'm being faithful. I'm going to be faithful here. I'm going to do my job as under the Lord. And whether there's 10,000 people in front of me or just 10 or three people in front of me, I'm still going to do what God has called me to do. And I, I know that he'll reward me for faithful service. When we studied 2 Timothy, you know, Paul says to Timothy, 
proclaim the word of God in the presence, I say this to you in the presence of Christ Jesus and God and the elect angels. So every time I stand up here, and this is true of all pastors, the elect angels, Jesus, the Father, are observing us as we do it. So when you do it, you do, and that's true of you too, when you, whatever you are doing in the Christian community, you might not be a pastor, God's watching what you're doing and he sees everything of our lives. So do everything with 100% effort as under the Lord because you will get rewards. And that takes faith to believe. I think a lot of Christians don't have that faith. Otherwise, they'd be serving a, a lot more diligence. Uh, and, but uh, the fact that they're not may uh, probably an indication that they don't believe that's the case. Well, you're in for a big surprise when you stand before Christ immediately after the rapture. You're going to have to stand before Christ at the Bema seat to give an account to your service to him. Were you a faithful servant or were you unfaithful? And Jesus talks about this unfaithful service in the Gospels. And a lot of people, he has a parable where people weren't expecting him to come back. And so God expects us to be anticipating him to come back. Uh, And we saw that in our study of the rapture. So the anticipation of Christ coming back at the rapture, which is followed by the Bema seat where we could get rewards, that should motivate us to live, uh, the anticipation of the rapture should motivate us to be faithful uh, stewards of the grace of God. So this reference to Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy being verbally and physically abused in Philippi here in 1 Thessalonians 2.2 speaks of these three men evangelizing this city during Paul's second missionary journey. The church in Philippi was established by these men just prior to to establishing the church in Thessalonica. Philippi, by the way, was the first church started in Europe. The first church that was started in Europe was Philippi. And Acts 16 records the account of these men evangelizing the city. So let's hold our place in 1 Thessalonians 2. 2. Let's go to Acts chapter 16, please. Acts chapter 16. Acts chapter 16. Look at Acts chapter 16. Look at verse 1. Acts 16, 1. He, that's Paul in context, also came to Derby and to Lystra. A disciple named Timothy was there, the son of a Jewish woman who was a believer, but whose father was a Greek. So technically, according to the word of God, Jews today wouldn't say that. They say, because your mother's Jewish, you're Jewish. But the Bible says, if your father is Jewish, that's why you're Jewish, not because your mother. And uh, so, but his mother, as we saw in 1 Timothy and 2 Timothy, Timothy's mother and grandmother were very strong believers and they taught him the word of God, not his father. So uh, that's like a lot of homes. uh, 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 The man is not very spiritual. Like I remember, you know, my dad wasn't a big, strong believer. My mother told me about the Trinity when I was a little boy and drove Jesus and the cross and the resurrection. Not my dad. She's the one who talked to me about it. Now, verse 2. The brothers in Lystra and Iconium spoke well of Timothy. Paul wanted Timothy to accompany him, and he took him and circumcised him because of the Jews who were in those places, for they all knew that his father was Greek. Now, you might say, well, I thought you, you, they weren't supposed to get circumcised. We're not talking about justification. Obviously, you're not justified. Uh, be, you don't get accepted by God because you're circumcised. Paul did this to Timothy, and Timothy was obviously in agreement because... Of the, of the Jews in these cities. He didn't want the Jews, the non-believing Jews, to not listen to his gospel because of Timothy. So Timothy, for the sake of the gospel being heard by these non-Jews, he got circumcised. So circumcision wasn't in the way. And this is what you see Paul and Timothy and Silvanus do. Money, they don't want money to be an issue. They took it off the table. Never, it didn't, so it wouldn't be a problem. So that's why they had Timothy's uh, circumcised. So it wouldn't be a stumbling block to these non-believing Jews to listen to the gospel. That's sacrifice, people. That's putting others ahead of yourself and God ahead of yourself. Look at verse 4. As they went through the towns, they passed on the decrees that had been decided on by the apostles and elders in Jerusalem for the Gentile believers to obey. He's referring to Acts 15, where the Jewish Christian community, many in the Jewish Christian community, who were Judaizers said, oh, the Gentiles are getting saved. Well, you got to get them circumcised. 
you got to do that. And the church council in Acts 15 said, no, you don't. That's what he's talking about. Verse 5, so the churches were being strengthened in the faith and were increasing in number every day. They went from, through the region of Phrygia and Galatia, having been prevented by the Holy Spirit from speaking the message in the province of Asia. When they came to Mycenae, they attempted to go to Bithynia, but the Spirit of Jesus did not allow them to do this. So they passed through Mycenae and went down to Troas. As a vision appeared to Paul during the night, a Macedonian man. Now, Macedonia is the Roman province where Philippi and Thessalonica are located. Okay? So a Macedonian man was standing there urging him, come over to Macedonia and help us. After Paul saw the vision, we attempted immediately to go to Macedonia, concluding that God had called us to proclaim the good news to them. We put out to sea from Troas and f- sailed a straight course to Samothrace, the next day to Neapolis, and from there to Philippi, which is a leading city of that district of Macedonia, a Roman colony. He stayed in this city for some days. And on the Sabbath day, we went outside the city gate to the side of the river where we thought there would be a place of prayer, and we sat down and began to speak to the women who had been assembled there. Now, he goes to the Jew first, then to the Gentile, Paul does. That's his, what he did. Now, the fact that he's going down to the river there means that they didn't have a synagogue, a Jewish synagogue in Philippi. So that's where the Jews would meet if they didn't have a synagogue. They'd go down by a river. So then he goes on to say, in verse 14, a woman named Lydia, a dealer in purple cloth from the city of Thyatira, a God-fearing woman, listened to us. The Lord opened her heart to respond to what Paul was saying, the gospel she was responding to in faith, after she and her household were baptized, which implies that she trusted in Jesus, she urged us, if you consider me to be a believer in the Lord, come and stay in my house, and she persuaded us. Now, as we were going to the place of prayer, a slave girl met us who had a spirit that enabled her to foretell the future by supernatural means, demons, possession she brought her own as a great prophet by fortune telling she followed behind paul and us and kept trying uh, crying out now us is speaking of paul sylvanus and us the other guy is is luke luke is now in the picture here and this is uh, what happens here the pl- you see the plural form there uh once you get to this part of acts because luke has joined the party now and luke became a great friend of paul and he was a doctor as we've saw in the past so It says in uh, in, in verse 17, she followed behind Paul and us and kept crying out, these men are servants of the Most High God who are proclaiming to you the way of salvation. She continued to do this for many days. But Paul became greatly annoyed and turned and said to the Spirit, I command you in the name of Jesus Christ to come out of her. And it came out of her at once. But when her owners saw their hope of profit was gone, it's always about money it seems like, right? They seized Paul and Silas, and that's Sylvanus, another name for him, way his name is uh, uh, used, and dragged them into the marketplace before the authorities. Both these guys, as we pointed out, are Roman uh, uh, citizens. That is dangerous to do that to a Roman citizen. You could get killed for touching a Roman citizen like that, manhandling them. They were being physically and verbally abused here. Look at verse 20. When they had brought them before their magistrates. And notice, by the way, Paul, Sylvanus, and Timothy are now pulling out their swords to defend themselves. Look what they're doing. Jesus said, uh, you know, he did say, turn the other cheek. Okay? And that's, unfortunately, some people take that out of context. So you're telling me, Bill, that we shouldn't have police. I'm not saying that. Police are there. The authorities are there for us, for our protection. They're from God. And, you know, they're, they're the ones that we, uh, uh, they're the ones that are used by God to get, uh, ju- uh, uh, um, to, uh, to get justice, to perform justice on our behalf. So there's no vigilantism going on. Because if you didn't have the, the authorities to exact justice, uh, then you'd have vigilantism. By the way, our government doesn't like, uh, many state governments don't believe in the death penalty. Well, They'll get, you might have somebody a problem with vigilantism when there's no justice, when a murderer, somebody murders your family and the government's not doing their job. That's to me, when a government's not doing his job is when they're not doing that, not performing justice and executing the murderer and the rapist and child molester. Those, that's when they're not doing their job. If they're not going to do the job, who's going to do it, the job? So they're held accountable by God for their failure to do that. Trust me, they will. They will be, and they are. So that's why you see them come and go 
<laughs> All right. So go, let's go on to say, let's see what this uh, uh, goes on to say here, this passage. So when, verse 20, when they had brought them before the magistrates, they said, these men are throwing our city into confusion. They are Jews and are advocating customs that are not lawful for us to accept or practice since we are Romans. So they were non-believers and they worshiped the, Greco, the, the Greco-Roman pantheon of gods. Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy were teaching the gospel of Jesus Christ. They didn't do that stuff. They were therefore considered atheists by the non-believing community in that day because they didn't worship the gods that they worshiped. What are you talking about? This Jesus was crucified on the Pontius Pilate, was raised from the dead. What are you talking about? So there was all kinds of crazy stuff they used to say about Christians too, by the way. We'll talk about that in the future. Look at verse 22. The crowd joined to attack join the attack against them and the magistrates tore the clothes off Paul and Silas and ordered them to be beaten with rods after they had been beaten had beaten them severely they threw them into prison and commanded the jailer to guide them securely this is absolutely totally unjust treatment in their Roman soldiers a citizens to boot what that just took place was absolutely horrendous treatment and you're being socially ostracized and you're being humiliated in public with people beating you, and beating you with rods, not baseball bats, okay? So look at it goes on to say in verse 24, receiving such orders, he threw them into the inner cell and fastened their feet in the stocks. After about midnight, Paul and Silas were praying and singing hymns to God, and the rest of the prisoners were listening to them. They weren't crying about the fact that, oh, we just got our butts kicked here, and we're bloodied and bludgeoned and humiliated publicly, verbally and physically abused, and what do they do? They sing and they're worshiping God. Why would you do that? That's crazy, right? No, because they know that they were considered worthy to suffer for the gospel. Philippians 1.29 says that it's a great honor to suffer for the cause of Christ. Some of your brothers and sisters in Christ are sitting over in places like India and China and right now are probably getting beaten. And they are praising God. I've seen pictures of people being crucified in some of these Muslim areas because they became believers as Muslims. They were Muslims. They believe in Jesus Christ and now they're humiliated publicly and murdered publicly in a hor- horrific fashion. I've seen the photos. And these people are, are they'll do, and they're pra- praising God as they're being put to death. That's, that's because they know that they've just been counted worthy to suffer for the cause of Christ. What a great privilege. The greatest thing you could ever have done for you is God allowing you to do, suffer for the cause of Christ and to be martyred. That You can't go out any better way than that. There's no other better way to leave this earth to suffer for Jesus. That is a great honor. And that's what these guys were thinking. Now look at it says in verse 26, God decides to intervene here. Suddenly a great earthquake occurred so that the foundations of the prison were shaken. Immediately all the doors flew open and the bonds of all the prisoners came loose. When the jailer woke up and saw the doors of the prison standing open, he drew his sword and was about to kill himself because they would have executed him for, for, for the, the prisoners leaving. And because he assumed the prisoners had escaped, see? However, look what it goes on to say. Paul called out loudly, Do not harm yourself, for we are all here. Calling for lights, the jailer rushed in and fell down, trembling at the feet of Paul and Silas. Then he brought them outside and asked, Sirs, what must I do to be saved? They replied, Believe in the Lord Jesus, and you will be saved, you and your household. Everybody in your household needs to do the same. Then they spoke the word of the Lord to him, along with all those who were in his house. At that hour of the night, he took them, here's the guy who is their jailer, He's now a believer. He took them and washed their wounds, and then he and all his family were baptized right away. The jailer brought them into his house and set food before them, and he rejoiced greatly that he'd come to believe in God together with his entire household. At day- daybreak, the magistrates sent their police officers saying, Release those men. The jailer reported these words to Paul saying, The magistrates have sent orders to release you, so come out now and go in peace. But Paul's smart. Remember Jesus said, be wise as serpents, gentle as doves. Well, Paul's being wise as a serpent here. He said to the police officers, they had beaten us in public without a proper trial, even though we are Roman citizens. And they threw us in prison. And now they want to send us away secretly? Absolutely not. They themselves must come out and escort us. I love that of Paul. You, You just want to 
just put this under the rug. Sure you do. Because if I go and complain to the Roman authorities, I go higher up, you're all dead men. And they knew it. You don't beat and do what you did to me, a Roman citizen, and Silas is out against the law, and you could be liable to be executed yourself. They were trembling before these guys. That's why I think Paul visited Philippi as much as he could and never had a problem with anybody in Philippi because he had them all in his back. He had leveraged them against them. He had leverage against them for what they did to him. And he never let them forget, he used that to get free access to Philippi in the whole area, really. So I'm sure he was never troubled again. So the police officers, verse 38, reported these words to the magistrates. They were frightened when they heard Paul and Silas were Roman citizens. And they came and apologized to them. That's what they should do. And they should also offer them restitution. So after they had brought them out, they asked them repeatedly to leave the city. And when they came out of the prison, they entered Lydia's house. And when they saw the brothers, they encouraged them and then departed. And where did they go? They go right down the road to Thessalonica. Look at chapter 17, verse 1. No chapter break in the original. You would think they would be discouraged about their, the, the, the terrible response that they received in Philippi. But no. As Paul says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, they kept right on communicating the gospel, even though they were getting their heads cracked and being beaten by rods. Look at Acts 17, 1. After they traveled to Amphipolis and Apollonia, they came to Thessalonica, where there was a Jewish synagogue. Paul went to the Jews in the synagogue, as he customarily did, and on three Sabbath days, he addressed them from the scriptures, explaining and demonstrating that the Christ has to suffer and arise from the dead, saying, this Jesus I'm proclaiming to you is the Christ. Some of them were persuaded and joined Paul and Silas, along with a large group of God-fearing Greeks and quite a few prominent women. But the Jews became jealous and gathering to, because the Gentiles were believing in the message too, eventually, and gathering together some worthless men from the rabble in the marketplace, they formed a mob and set the city in an uproar. They attacked Jason's house, trying to find Paul and Silas to bring them out to the assembly, because they wanted to beat them again, like they did in Philippi. When they did not find them, they dragged Jason and some of the brothers before the city officials, screaming, these people who have stirred up trouble throughout the world have come here too. And they're probably alluding to Philippi. And Jesus, Jason has welcomed them as guests. They're all acting against Caesar's decrees, saying there is another king named Jesus. They caused confusion among the crowd and the city officials who heard these things. And after the city officials had received bail from Jason and the others, they released them. So there's Paul, Silvanus, and their nice little trip, which as Constable says, wasn't a vacation. It was not a picnic. It was brutal. And they were beaten up but communicating the truth, the gospel of Jesus Christ. That is dedication. That's perseverance. And that's the, that what Paul's mentioning in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2. This is what he's talking about in that passage. Their treatment in Philippi. Now go back, if you could, to Acts, uh, 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, please. If you could, look at my translation of that verse. 1 Thessalonians 2, 2. First Thessalonians 2 Thessalonians 2.2. But in fact, although we previously suffered, yes, we were verbally and physically abused in Philippi, as each one of you are well aware of, for our benefit, we courageously communicated the one and only gospel originating from the one and only God and the presence of each of you by means of God's spirit or God's power in the face of great opposition. The Net Bible, they translate those, that verse, but although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. So we see there that 1 Thessalonians 2.2 is a concessive clause, and I'll explain what that means in a minute. You see the word although in your translation and mine? That's expressing a, a concessive idea. So verse 2 has two assertions. The first states that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy suffered undeservedly prior to their visit in Thessalonica. And specifically, as we have pointed out, and you saw in Acts 16, they were verbally and physically abused, which the Thess Thessalonians were well aware of. Now the second assertion in verse 2 states that these men courageously communicated the gospel originating from God in the presence of the Thessalonians by means of God's power 
in the face of great opposition. So the idea behind this concessive clause, which is marked by the word although, is that it was true this, that these men proclaimed the gospel courageously to the Thessalonians, despite the fact, or although, they suffered and were verbally and physically abused for proclaiming this same gospel in Philippi, or Philippi prior to their visit to Thessalonica. So that's very important. So this is telling you, again, why does he have to say this? He's saying this because in light of the context, people in Thessalonica, non-Jews, uh, Gentile non-believers, Jewish non-believers were slanderously attacking Paul and Silvanus, saying bad things about them that were not true. We can see from chapter 2 that they were accusing them of being greedy, uh, that they were, uh, they were just uh, exploiting them, and that they really didn't care for them. That's why they left Thessalonica. They don't really care about you. So Paul saying, and Silvanus and Timothy are saying, you know that's not too true. You know what he says? As you know, he says that a lot, you know this is true. We were suffered, you know, we suffered in Philippi for teaching the gospel, and we came right down the road and didn't stop teaching the gospel. We suffered here in Thessalonica too. That's why we had to leave the city. Not because we're, we're, uh, we're itinerant um, uh, charlatans who are just looking to exploit you for money or trying to get uh, people to fall, uh, get, get gain adherence or start, start some strange, uh, whacked out religion. No, we're legitimate. We're sincere. We really care about you. This is why we're doing it. Now, if you see that uh, in the, uh, the Net Bible, their translation, in verse 2, it says, in, uh, let me just flip it back here. In 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, it says, but although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, he says, we had the courage in our God to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. So the, the phrase, uh, in our God, uh, it should be translated by means of God's power, as you can see in my translation. And the reference to God there is a reference to the Holy Spirit, not the Father. Now, how do I get that? Well, this interpretation is indicated, uh, uh, this prepositional phrase is indicated by the verb in this passage, which is the word parasi azomai. Parasi azomai is the, talks about suffering in 1 Thessalonians 2 2. So that word and the content of 1 Thessalonians 1 5 makes it clear that we should translate this word or this phrase in our God by means of God's power. Uh, now, the, the uh, par, uh, par, parecia azomai in 1 Thessalonians 2 2, it refers to Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy proclaiming the gospel courageously to the Thessalonians. And then we saw in 1 Thessalonians 1 5 that these three men, they said, possessed the conviction that their proclamation of the gospel was by no means manifested by the act of speaking only, but on the contrary, by means of power as well as as well, and specifically, the Holy Spirit's power, as well with deep conviction. So, I'm telling you the phrase in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, in our God, it actually means by means of God's power. How do I know that? Well, 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, Paul says, we proclaim the gospel by means of the Holy Spirit's power. Uh, hold your place. Look at first. Th- you can go to your translation of uh, the Net Bible. 1 Thessalonians 1, 5, coming near the end here. It says it in... Uh, in verse 4, start it with verse 4. 1 Thessalonians 1, 4. We know, brothers and sisters, loved by God, that he has chosen you, and that our gospel did not come to you merely in words, but in power. Okay? Okay, we talk about in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2 power. But in power and in the Holy Spirit, and with deep conviction. Uh, my translation of that exact uh, same verse goes as follows. You don't have to turn there if you can, if you want. At the same time, Each and every one of us possesses the conviction that our proclamation of the gospel was by no means manifested by the act of speaking only, but on the contrary, by means of power as well. So you compare that what he says in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, that in God and in our God means by means of God's power, because he's saying, speaking of speaking of the communicating the gospel in both passages, and 1 Thessalonians 1, 5 says he did it in God's power. And then he says in the same way, actually specifically he says, it was manifested by the Holy Spirit's power as well as deep conviction. So God, in our God in 1 Thessalonians 2, 2, has got to be speaking of the Holy Spirit because both passages mention God's power, Paul and Silvanus and Timothy communicating the gospel and 
the first Thessalonians 1 5 mentions the Holy Spirit they did it in his power so in our God you could if you want to keep a, a little mental note or write it in your Bibles it be, means by means of God's power thus the reference to God and first Thessalonians 2 2 refers to the Holy Spirit and also this word uh, contains the figure of metonymy where God the Holy Spirit is put for his power you see this uh, in all types of languages, this metonymy. And so this would mean uh, 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 it's, uh, God is, uh, the Holy Spirit is put for his power here, which was the means. His power was the means by which Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy communicated the gospel to the Thessalonians. That's why you hear me before service. I say, I, we got to get in fellowship with God so I can teach the gospel and be used mightily by the Holy Spirit and you can receive the gospel by the power of the Holy Spirit. Now, how do I do that? I interpret what the Holy Spirit is saying in the, in the Bible accurately and communicate it accurately. And when I'm in fellowship, confess my sins and obeying God, the Spirit works mightily through me. And he speaks to each person individually and as individuals and as a corporate unit. That's got to be all. That's all the Holy Spirit. That if I, I can't rely on my own intellect or strength or power or tools of persuasion and that's why it's not how, how eloquent you are or how charismatic you are. Uh, Paul was not, neither one of those. And yet God used him mightily. You might be charismatic and that's great. And you might be good to look at and well-spoken. But some, not all of us are well-spoken. Some of us stumble of our words. Some of us don't have tremendous voices. We have squeaky voices. Uh, we, we, we don't have the, the bellowing voice that some guys has, but have. But it doesn't matter. God can use all types of men and women to teach the gospel, all because of the Spirit's power. So therefore, this prepositional phrase, in our God, uh, is teaching that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy communicated the gospel to the Thessalonians courageously by means of the Spirit's power. Again, he says pretty much the same thing in 1 Thessalonians 1.5. Now, and we'll come into the end here. When 1 Thessalonians 2.2 2 speaks of these men experiencing suffering, verbal and physical abuse and great opposition, they are a reference to the persecution that they experienced while communicating the gospel to the Thessalonians, which was undeserved suffering. Undeserved suffering means suffering you don't bring on yourself. A lot of times we bring on our own suffering. You know, for instance, uh, you're a teenage girl and you get pregnant by a boy and you're not married and you, you're fooled around the backseat of the car. Next thing you know, you got a little papoose and you're nine months pregnant and now what are you going to do? That's, that, you brought that on yourself. You know, that's your own bad decision. And same thing for the guy who got her pregnant. You made a bad decision. Uh, we do, we're sinners. We've all made bad decisions. The question is, well, you pick yourself up after you make the bad decisions because everybody fails. The people who get up and continue forward, that builds character. We all fail. Confess your sin. Do what God says, and that will build character. A quitter never wins, and a winner never quits. Always remember that. Now, notice, I translate uh, uh, the, uh, the participle form of this verb, paraisia azomai, for our benefit, we courageously... And now, in that particular phrase, notice for our benefit, a, a quick one here, I mentioned it earlier, I want to close with this. Look at my translation, you can see it in my translation. 1 Thessalonians 2.2. 2. It says, but in fact, although we previously suffered, yes, we were verbally and physically abused in Philippi, as each one of you are well aware of, for our benefit, we courageously communicated the one only gospel originating from the, only, the one and only God and the presence of each of you by means of God's uh, power in the face of great opposition. The Net Bible, I'll show you what this word is, is in the Net Bible translation. Uh, 1 Thessalonians 2.2 2. But although we suffered earlier and were mistreated in Philippi, as you know, we had the courage to declare to you the gospel of God in spite of much opposition. Now the word, uh, when it says we had the courage, the verb there is in the middle voice. Now, the middle voice, it's interesting. I translate it for our benefit, which is uh, right to do. It's nothing wrong with doing that by, by me doing that. What does that mean, though? And uh, I want to close with this. Well, it's the middle voice here means the subject acts by himself or herself or in his or her own interest. The subject shows a special interest in the action of the verb. So here, what, he's, what Paul's and Sylvanus and Timothy are telling us in 1 Thessalonians 2.2, 2, 
And this is an application that we'll be able to get from it. We'll get an application from this. It's expressing the idea that Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy acted for their own benefit by communicating boldly and fearlessly the gospel from God by the power of the Holy Spirit despite great persecution and physical suffering and social abuse. Okay? How would it benefit them? It would benefit them because they would receive rewards for doing so. Okay? So when you are going through things and you're persevering, you're serving in a church, giving, serving, coming to Bible class, attending classes, uh, praying for the ministry, being a part of the ministry, you and you have trials and tribulations in your life and you might even be persecuted by people, whether at work or your neighborhood or friends or school and know that God sees what you're going through. Undeserved suffering that you didn't bring on yourself, he will reward you for this. He promises us rewards. Remember, Jesus said that, you, you know, you, uh, I, I suffered if the master, your God and Savior suffered and was mistreated and persecuted. You're not greater than me. You will be suffer, you'll suffer persecution like I would, I will. And therefore, because a, a servant is not greater than his master, Jesus taught. So uh, we, this is what we have going on here. So persecution is one of the major themes that we see in 1 Thessalonians, and we see it here in 1 Thessalonians 2 too. And despite the fact, and we'll wrap up with this, despite Paul Silvanus being persecuted and verbally abused in Philippi, they went right down the road and did the same thing in Philippi, uh, Thessalonica, communicated the gospel, and were persecuted there. That tells you their sincerity. That they're not out for personal to make a, a, to make a, to, to promote themselves personally or to gain adherence or money to, to, uh, to uh, exploit people for money because no one would do what they did after being persecuted and abused in Philippi, go down, down the road and do the exact same thing because they didn't get personal notoriety and applause and money from the people in Philippi. They got physical abuse. They got beaten with rods. So this is telling Paul, Silvanus and Timothy is saying these things in 1 Thessalonians 2 too, to tell to reassure the Thessalonians. See, we're sincere. People who are insincere don't do the things that we've done. They don't. Who do, they don't do that. Those philosophers of the day, they don't do that, but we did. That shows you how we're legitimate and it shows the power of God's working us, in us because who keeps doing that? Only the power of God can get us through stuff like that. So you know God's working in our ministry and in our lives and the gospel that you received was not in vain. It's from God. We're from God and we've demonstrated that by our tremendous courage in the face of tremendous persecution and adversity. Well, we'll uh, wrap this up uh, with a, a closing prayer and uh, uh, well, uh, thank you for being a good audience here, a great audience here this morning as always. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time to study your word. We pray that this message would touch the hearts of your people, give them encouragement, and give them discernment in their walk with you, and help them to continue to grow in the grace and knowledge of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, to gain more and more courage to speak the bo gospel boldly and to live it out in our lives, apply it, the gospel in our own lives so that we might receive a reward at the Bema seat like Paul, Silvanus, and Timothy will. So we pray for this service in our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ's name, amen. All right, you're dismissed.